tonight. Bring them back. Protesters plead for the return of their loved ones, taken hostage by Hamas with a march to Jerusalem. Both sides continue to stay unyielding to any new compromises suggested by negotiators. Putin's address. Russia's leader addresses the nation in his annual speech to his citizens, reaffirming the country's stance against pressing Western powers. A triumph for Trump. Donald Trump sees some light at the end of a long legal tunnel as the Supreme Court greenlights an appeal on his immunity charges, effectively delaying his eventual judgment day. And leaping for joy, sisters with an unlikely birthday celebrate a day that comes only once every four years. All that and more as World News Tonight starts right now. This is Ava Vedana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here's Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. Hello and good evening. You're joining us on World News. It's a very special day today, the 29th of February, or better known as Leap Day. So it's great to have you join in on a day that happens only every four years. Let's get you right to some key global updates. We're starting off once again in Israel. A group of Israelis have begun a four-day march to Jerusalem from an area near the Gaza border to demand the release of the hostages still being held in the Palestinian territory. The group says they just want their loved ones back home immediately. The group will pass through several towns on their march, which they hope will pressure Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu amid ongoing negotiations for a new truce in the Israel-Hamas war. They left from Reim, the area on the border with Gaza where the Nova Music Festival took place on October 7th last year, and where more than 350 people were killed by Hamas. 145 days later, these Israelis are marching for the hostages still being held by the Palestinian Islamist group in the enclave. The families of the hostages will pass through several towns on their four-day march before reaching their final stop in Jerusalem on Saturday. They're hoping to put pressure on Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. The march comes amid ongoing negotiations for a ceasefire and the release of hostages. A week-long truce in November last year, brokered by Qatar and Egypt, saw dozens of Israeli hostages freed in exchange for the release of Palestinian prisoners. So far, 102 Israeli hostages, mainly women and children, have been released. And now we move on to Russia, where we saw President Vladimir Putin commence his annual address. The Kremlin leader kicked off with two themes common to Putin's speeches as of late, accusing the West of trying to destroy Russia and claiming that the Russian people are united in their support for what he still continues to call the special military operation, which is the war in Ukraine. President Putin covered a range of key issues during his two-hour speech. Putin claimed that the West wanted to see a dying Russia, but it had miscalculated because of the determination and the unity of the Russian people. He warned that any deployment of Western troops in Ukraine would have tragic consequences. And he warned that Western rhetoric threatened a conflict with use of nuclear arms and consequently the destruction of civilization. He added that the Russia's strategic nuclear weapons were in full combat readiness. But the bulk of Putin's speech was dedicated to domestic issues. He praised the new Russian business that emerged after Western departures because of the sanctions. He said digitalization was key, stressing that high-speed internet should be available to everyone across the vast country. Putin also called for the modernization of taxation in Russia for purposes of a fair distribution of tax burden. And he also announced a number of environmental and climate projects. Meanwhile, Russia also said that its forces have controlled a strategic village in the Azika direction, while Ukraine has claimed that it has launched attacks on Russian air defense systems. The Russian army repelled multiple rounds of attack of the Ukrainian army and launched offensive in Kupanysk and other directions, destroying various equipment such as tanks, armored vehicles and self-propelled artillery of the Ukrainian army. And for more on this, we have other than the World News Special Correspondent Simashi Pereira from Moscow in Russia. Simashi. Is Anuradi. Russian air defense forces also shot down several HIMARS rockets. Meanwhile, Ukraine President Volodymyr Zelensky discussed the Russian-Ukraine crisis with the South Crown Prince and the Prime Minister Mohammed bin Salman al-Saud. 
The Saudi Crown Prince reaffirmed his country's support for all international endeavors aimed at resolving the crisis and achieving peace. And it continued the contribution alleviating the situation through humanitarian assistance. In an unexpected event, pro Russian rebels, in especially silver of Moldova, have asked President Vladimir Putin to protect their region from what they claim are threats from the Moldovan government. Shanistas, which illegally split Moldova as the Soviet Union crumbled, has remained firmly within the Kremlin's orbit while Moldova, which borders Ukraine, is bidding to join the European Union. Back to you, Anuradi. All right, thank you very much. That was other than world news special correspondent Simashi Pereira from Moscow in Russia. And now we move on to some updates on Trump's legal troubles. It seems that things are finally looking up for him as the Supreme Court agreed to hear the former president's claims of presidential immunity from prosecution for trying to overturn his 2020 election loss. That decision will further delay Trump's criminal prosecutions, potentially giving him a boost as he runs to regain the presidency and thrusting the nation's top judicial body with a 6-3 to three conservative majority and three Trump-appointed justices into the election frame. The justices will freeze the election subversion case being pursued by special counsel Jack Smith. That trial won't start on March 4th, and there's no new trial date. Trump claims he is immune to prosecution because he was president when he took actions aimed at reversing President Joe Biden's election victory over him. The Supreme Court will review a lower court's rejection of Trump's claim of immunity from prosecution and scheduled the case for the week of April 22nd where they'll focus on one question. Whether and if so, to what extent does a former president enjoy presidential immunity from criminal prosecution for conduct alleged to involve official acts during his tenure in office? Trump on social media hailed the Supreme Court's decision to hear his immunity claim. He wrote, Without presidential immunity, a president will not be able to properly function or make decisions in the best interest of the United States of America. On February 6, the U.S. Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit ruled against Trump's immunity claim. The three-judge panel wrote it could not accept that the office of the presidency places its former occupants above the law for all time thereafter. Trump supporters attacked the Capitol in January 2021, aiming to prevent Biden from being certified. That's after Trump and his allies made false claims that the 2020 election was stolen and devised a plan to use false electors to thwart Biden's victory. If Trump regains the presidency, he could use his powers to force an end to the prosecution or potentially pardon himself for any federal crimes. Also on Wednesday, an Illinois judge stripped Trump from the state's Republican presidential primary ballot, siding with voters who argued that the former president defied the anti-insurrection clause of the Constitution's 14th Amendment. She delayed her ruling from taking effect in light of an expected appeal by Trump. The Supreme Court is soon expected to rule on a separate but similar case that also puts it in the election spotlight over the former president's eligibility to be on the ballot in Colorado, having heard arguments earlier in February. And on the road to the White House tonight, GOP presidential candidate Nikki Haley told U-Turns that voters deserve a leader with moral clarity during a campaign rally at Utah Valley University. The former UN ambassador's visit to Utah comes as she makes a last-minute plea to voters ahead of the Super Tuesday primary. Haley criticized the direction the Republican Party is heading under former President Trump's influence. She was quoted saying at some point, if Republicans really want to get this back on track, they've got to acknowledge that maybe Donald Trump is the reason they're losing. During her address, one heckler yelled that she didn't win South Carolina, a reference to Haley's embarrassing double-digit loss in her home state GOP primary. Haley has garnered considerable support from some of Utah's top GOP leaders. Lieutenant Governor Deidre Henderson and First Lady Abby Cox endorsed the former South Carolina governor in January. GOP voters have demonstrated lukewarm support for Trump in Utah, a deeply religious state where many residents belong to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. During Utah's GOP primary in 2016, Trump came in third, collecting about 14% of the vote. Trump went on to garner about 45% of the vote on election day 
last year, the lowest share of any other red state. Let's go for a short commercial break. We'll be back with more key regional stories. Stay tuned. Welcome back. Before we go in for any regional stories, we're still in the U.S. now as U.S. congressional leaders say they've struck a deal to avert a partial government shutdown by the end of the week. That will pave the way for votes on a stopgap bill to keep the lights on in the government through until mid-March. The temporary measure will be voted on by the House and Senate this week. That's according to a joint statement by House Speaker Mike Johnson, Senate and House leaders, and the leaders of the two chambers' appropriations panels. They say they agree to advance six of 12 annual bills by March 8th and the rest on March 22nd, giving lawmakers time to examine and debate the four-year funding bills. Republican Representative Kevin Hearn told reporters the temporary funding bill would be put to a House vote on Thursday. It would be the fourth such measure in the fiscal year that began last October 1st. Lawmakers disagree on funding and aid to U.S. allies, with hardline Republicans wanting to see more spending cuts. Both parties now have to convince their ranks to back the stopgap deal. But if voting fails, it would bring the federal government to the brink of partial shutdowns on Saturday. And an update tonight on the farmers' lament. Polish farmers staged a new round of protests in the capital, Warsaw, reiterating their opposition to European Union policies related to agriculture, following a spate of similar demonstrations which have been sweeping across Europe. Polish farmers took to the streets of the country's capital on Tuesday, carrying out their largest demonstration yet. Parliamentary Speaker Szymon Harownia reportedly said their demands will be met. Poland's farmers oppose the EU's Green Deal and the influx of Ukrainian agricultural products, which they say are undermining prices at home. According to city authorities, 10,000 people participated, but organizers claim the figure was closer to 50,000. The Polish parliamentary speaker told farmers that any matter tabled in the lower house would be taken care of. Despite the discussions, a spokesperson for the farmers said talks were unsatisfactory, whilst Kiev denies their exports are creating risks for the Polish market. Meanwhile, Poland's farmers said that if their demands are not met, they will paralyze the country and stage another major protest in Warsaw on March 6. And over in South Korea, we are counting down the hours to the deadline for the return of doctors in training as set by the government amid their mass departure last week in protests of plans to boost the number of medical practitioners. Here are some of the latest updates on that front. Thursday marks the return to work deadline set by the government for doctors protesting the planned medical school quota increase. The government has called on doctors to resume work by February 29th, stating those who comply will not face any legal penalties. In a final step that would allow the government to file a criminal complaint over the collective action, health ministry officials visited the homes of trainee doctors in person on Wednesday to deliver return to work orders. Previously, these orders had been issued through mail or text messages. Those who do not return to work by today will face suspension of their medical licenses or additional legal action. Meanwhile, Interior Minister Lee Sang-min in a briefing on Thursday announced a set of measures to bolster medical services. Those include increasing the number of medical school professors at national universities by 1,000 by 2027, addressing concerns that higher medical school quotas might undermine education quality. He also said the government will expedite the establishment of new metropolitan emergency medical situation rooms. These facilities, originally scheduled to open by May, are now slated to be fully operational starting next Monday. Amid rising tensions between doctors and the government, some residents are now making moves to return to their posts. The health ministry on Thursday, without providing the exact number of returning residents by hospital, said that over 294 trainee doctors have returned to their posts. In an effort to find a breakthrough with doctors, the health ministry has scheduled a discussion for 4 p.m. on Thursday in Seoul. The second vice minister of health and welfare, Pang Min-soo, has reached out to the resigning resident doctors, 
inviting them for a dialogue, but despite multiple public invitations, Buck has yet to secure successful dialogue. He has clarified that the meeting is open not just to the representatives from the Korean Intern Resident Association, but also to any resident doctor eager to join the conversation. In Malaysia now, Norway's King Harold, aged 87 and in poor health, is improving from an infection that forced him to be hospitalized while on holiday in Malaysia. The Royal House of Norway said in a statement that the king will remain in hospital on the island of Langkawi and it is not yet known when he will return home. For more on this, we have other than the World News Special Correspondent Nevami Ranasinghe from Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia. Nevami. Thank you, Anuradi. The statement said the king's personal physician is in Langkawi and confirms that the king is improving from his infection. His Majesty's is well taken care of at the hospital and is receiving good treatment. It added that His Majesty will remain at the hospital for a few more days. No decision has been made regarding his return home. King Harald has been Norway's ceremonial head of state since 1991 and is Europe's oldest living monarch. Meanwhile, Cambodian Prime Minister Hang Manet met with his Malaysian counterpart Anwar Ibrahim where joint investments and energy corporations were bilaterally discussed. Speaking after their meeting, Anwar said the value of investment by Malaysian companies in Cambodia exceeded 3 billion US dollars. Back to you Anuradi. All right, thank you very much. That was other than a World News Special Correspondent Nevami Ranasinghe from Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia. We're over in Japan now where there's some continued concern as the number of births in Japan fell to a record low in 2023. This is according to preliminary government data and it is the eighth straight year that the number of babies born in the country fell, underscoring the daunting task that the country faces in trying to stem population decline. The number of marriages also fell to below 500,000 for the first time in 90 years, foreboding a further decline in the population, as out-of-wedlock births are rare in Japan. Yoshi Masahayashi is the chief cabinet secretary. The decline of births is a crisis. The next six years up until the 2030s, when the population of young generations is expected to decline rapidly, are the last chance to see if the declining birth rate trend can be reversed. And I believe we are at a time when we have to take urgent measures. Mindful of the potential social and economic impact and the strains on public finances, Prime Minister Fumio Kishida has called the trend the gravest crisis our country faces. He unveiled a range of steps to support childbearing households late last year. According to estimates by the National Institute of Population and Social Security Research, Japan's population will likely decline by about 30 percent by 2070, with four out of every 10 people aged 65 or older. Let's go for a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. Stay tuned. Welcome back. Some interesting tech updates now. We're seeing generative AI tech evolve day by day. And Korean researchers are making big advances. A group of researchers in the country developed the world's fastest generative AI that can create images for a given sentence within two seconds. Researchers input a sentence into the system. After entering a sentence that reads, a realistic photo of an astronaut reading a book on Mars under the moon, two seconds later, the Koala 700M developed in South Korea is the first to come up with an image. Following that, Carlo, made by Kakao Brain, took 3.6 seconds to come up with an image, while Dell E2 and Dell E3, developed by OpenAI, took over 10 seconds each. Among generative AIs that convert text descriptions into images, Koala 700M is the fastest in the world. High speed is achieved by the development of a knowledge distillation technology, which transfers a knowledge from a large model to a smaller model without loss of validity. The researchers have also developed a model that incorporates a visual intelligence technology into a conversational AI. Named Kolava, it allows AI and humans to ask and answer questions about images or videos. 
The research team plans to expand the utility of the knowledge distillation technology, proven effective in image generation to other areas, and develop a leading artificial intelligence. And finally tonight, imagine having a birthday that comes only once in four years. Would you be happy that you wouldn't age or sad because people will only wish you once in so long? Well, for these sisters, it's become tradition as they share not only blood, but also their birthdays. And that too on such an unlikely day like today. Happy birthday to you. It only happens every four years. These sisters celebrate their actual birthday on Leap Day, February 29th. The oldest, Eliana, turns 12. Evelyn turns 8. I like to share my birthday with my sister because she's my best friend. And I like to share my birthday with my sister because we get to party all week. About 5 million people in the world have Leap Day birthdays, but who knows how many families have two Leap Year babies. Almost three years ago, Chad and Melissa Croft had another baby girl. They named her Elizabeth. I think in the future, every year that it actually lands on the 29th, we'll do a big party for both the girls. And then on the off, day, off years, they'll just get to pick whatever date they want to have their birthday on to make it special. And of course, if they pick the same day, we'll do two cakes and We'll make it pretty fun. So have they adhered to that all these years later? Yep, they have two cakes. Usually, the, you know, the 29th will always make sure that we do something in addition to it on that day. But yeah, it really comes down to the, the weekend before or after, um, you know, where it's pretty close. But honestly, if I had to share a birthday with a sibling, I might just go crazy. But clearly, there's nothing but love between these two angels. Well, that's all the stories we have for you tonight. We'll see you again next time with more updates on the happenings of the world. Thank you for watching. Have a good night.